The pandemic and Black Lives Matter, not to mention the 2020 election in the United States, raise issues around truth, evidence, doubt, confusion, ideology, controversy, authority, fiction and disagreement. Also, consider the changing meaning of the OK sign into a white power gesture. And what about the postponement of the Philip Guston retrospective at Tate Modern because his self-portrait paintings depict the artist in a KKK hood? Anti-maskers have conjured up the image of the mask as a muzzle in order to contest the meaning of the mask doubting scientific or government advice and disputing evidence, as well as conspiracy theories about the origin and purpose of the virus, have been integral to the cultural experience of the coronavirus, not only in what people say, but also in what they do. Conflicts over restrictions to movement, the closure of businesses, the wearing of masks and social distancing are all acts characterised by disputes over meaning. At the same time, the global response to the death of George Floyd in March 2020 intensified and widened the engagement in controversies over the interpretation and meaning of racism, anti-racism, whiteness and white supremacy. The slogan and hashtag Black Lives Matter was already at the heart of controversies of interpretation by the adherents of All Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter, as well as being extended by the advocates of Black Women Matter, Black Girls Matter, Black Gay Lives Matter, Black Bi Lives Matter and Black Trans Lives Matter. But it's fair to say that 2020 has amplified all of these questions. When Darnella Frazier's smartphone video of Derek Chauvin slowly, steadily killing George Floyd was uploaded and shared, the existing disagreements about the meaning of Black Lives Matter and its conservative and neo-fascist rivals became a global debate on the meaning of whiteness and anti-blackness, the meaning of the statues of slave owners and the meaning of taking them down, the meaning of taking the knee and the meaning of not taking the knee. I'm claiming then that the events of 2020 indicate the need to take meaning seriously and I will try in these two short online lectures to outline an approach to meaning in art that is adequate to the task. But first, I want to dwell for a moment on the apparent eclipse of meaning in the preference for useful art in the last 10 or 15 years. There is a political value to the demand that art do something, to play down the meaning of artworks in favour of more practical questions of use, including the advocacy of participation in art, the problem of art washing, and issues around the remuneration of art's unpaid labourers. However, my claim is that the idea of art as having direct benefits for its users reaches a kind of limit when faced with COVID-19, Black Lives Matter and fake news. Proposed originally by the Cuban artist Tanya Bruguera, Art Util roughly translates into English as useful art, but it goes further suggesting art as a tool or device. Art Util draws on artistic thinking to imagine, create and implement tactics that change how we act in society. Bruguera contrasts the legacy of the ready-made, bringing something into the museum so that it is looked at rather than used, and propaganda, which puts art to a specific political use, saying, for me it is very important that art goes beyond showing things, instead we need to propose change and implement it through art. In useful art, meaning in one sense disappears, or, according to Stephen Wright, is retired. The kinds of meanings associated with the activities of contemplation, interpretation, the scrutiny of analysis and the pleasures of association give way to the practices of utilisation. Artists or authors are replaced with initiators and viewers or spectators are replaced with users. However, Bruguera argues that art utile can be useful at one point and then something else later, which opens up the legitimacy of meaning and interpretation in art utile once it has entered the museum or becomes the object of theoretical interest after the event, so to speak. And Stephen Wright points out that the art utile archive is what it is and is a proposition. In other words, it is an archive and it is about the archive. It has meaning about the archive beyond the archive. 
And finally, as I want to stress, it is important to trace the origin of the idea of use in art to the death of the author and the birth of the reader. That is to say, use, and especially misuse, as this has been encouraged in art, is an offshoot from arguments about the benefits of the viewer and the reader taking liberties with and elaborating on the intended meanings of artworks. In this respect, art util is best understood as an extrapolation of discredited models of interpretation that presuppose the passive reception of given or fixed or authorised meanings. It may seem that art has traditionally been restricted to questions of meaning, whereas now it is possible for art to make a real difference directly in lived experience. However, the legitimacy of meaning in art has always ebbed and flowed. For significant periods, sophistication and cultivation in art has been associated with focusing on style, technique and form instead of meaning. To the connoisseur, the aesthete or the modernist, all talk of the meaning of artworks is naive or philistine. Meaning, in the history of art's theories of reception, is exemplified not by art, but by kitsch, propaganda and authoritarianism. Meaning, in the sense I'm thinking of it here, as distinct from and subordinated to the display of taste in the nuanced appreciation of art and aesthetics, is not the default mode of engaging with art but springs up only under certain conditions. For instance, meaning became a prominent concern in art, hi in art history and art theory as modernism and formalism lost their power to monopolise the field. At the same time, meaning became an urgent issue by insisting that the emphasis on originality, style, technique and form in modernism obscured vital questions about the social significance of the image and the politics of the art world. Borrowing from social history, ideology critique, subculture theory, psychoanalysis and semiotics, the discussion of the meaning of artworks emphasised narrative, everyday life, psychic life, myth, ideology critique, biography, history and memory, only with the rise of the social history of art, the rise of the feminist art history, the rise of post-colonial art history and queer theory. One of the most prominent ways in which the concern with meaning legitimated itself at the beginning and drove itself on later was through the embrace of semiotics. Semiotics, which was invented as a science of signs in the 19th century by Ferdinand de Saussure in Switzerland and Charles Sanders Peirce in the USA, was revived in the 1950s by Roland Barthes, but was rarely applied to art until the 1960s and 1970s with John Berger initially as a critique of traditional art history, but later in postmodernism as part of a challenge to the formalism of high modernism. Semiotics introduced a new level of analytical precision to art history and art criticism by identifying the component parts of signification, specifically in the differentiation of signs, icons and indexes, as well as of signifier signified referent text context and so on. Artists informed by such ideas were emboldened to regard individual images as powered by signifying systems and codes and to regard the meanings of artworks as embedded in discourses. In its structuralist era, semiotics frequently operated on the assumption that the meanings of signs were determined by sets of internal oppositions and differences mapped out with a static system. That is to say, semiotics could be a theory of fixed meanings that are encoded by authors and decoded by viewers. However, post-structuralist semiotics argued that all meaning is indeterminate, open and interminable. Nothing, not even the social conditions in which an artwork is produced or is encountered, can secure a fixed meaning for an artwork according to a semiotics that stresses the free play of the signifier. That is to say, semiotics could reduce meaning to a linear passage of a message in an ABC sequence from the author to the addressee via the sign. And at the same time, semiotics could insist that all three elements have been dissolved in the death of the author, the open work and the birth of the reader. So within semiotics itself, there is a tension 
between fixed and interminable meaning are open and closed works that continues to be active today in debates on interpretation. Jean-Jacques Le Cercle depicts this linear fixed model of meaning in structuralist semiotics through the image of a tin opener. In the tin opener theory of interpretation, artworks seem to contain a meaning put in by the artist, which the viewer must pull out. Interpretation on this model consists of solving puzzles and tracing meanings back to their source in the artist's intentions, personality or activity. In place of this, Le Cercle argues that interpretation is not the disclosure of a fixed, concealed meaning, but a making sense of the text. Borrowing from Walter Benjamin, he prefers to think of interpretation and all meaning through the idea of translation as a transformative act. Susan Sontag's book, Against Interpretation, was not against meaning, but against code in the sense of meanings being encoded and in need of being decoded, against the idea of opacity in the sense of a concealed meaning, and against salvage in the sense of recovering an already existing message placed in a work by the author. A simplistic opposition has formed in the wake of these attempts to understand meaning in a more complex way. We have inherited the binary of the closed or open work in which the reader or viewer is trapped into decoding meanings or freed to invent new ones. Meaning is presented, therefore, as either objective and fixed or subjective and unstable. Either the author is the source of all meanings or the death of the author results in the reader being the source of all meanings. One response is to treat the meanings of artworks as beyond the province of artists who are reduced to asking questions, making suggestions, exploring possibilities and above all leaving things open for the plurality of viewers. Umberto Eco's concept of the open work was formulated initially to distinguish avant-garde art from traditional art. The open work is an artwork that is specifically formed to be open to interpretations whereas the closed work demands the obedient cooperation of the reader or viewer to a given meaning concealed within it. This is obviously overstated, given that every artwork is open to different interpretations. And so Echo overlays his distinction between the open and closed work with a second distinction between first degree openness and second degree openness. First degree openness is the openness of every work and every idea to multiple meanings. Whereas second degree openness is the conspicuous or conscientious openness of modern, avant-garde, postmodern, and contemporary art, that is to say, works that are deliberately made to foster a proliferation of different, indeterminate and interminable interpretations. Echo's opposition is based on a misrepresentation of traditional art. The nobility gave provisional value to handicraft in the assessment of works of art, but a higher value to design, composition, invention and judgment, that is to say, to the features of artworks that called for cultivation, scholarship, taste, character and liberty. Since Echo describes the open work and the closed work as poles in the modernist opposition of high art versus mass art, his theory of meaning is continuous with the traditions of noble culture that he initially seems to reject. Echo does not advocate a form of relativism, allowing for different fixed interpretations, but a two-tier system in art, in which authors or artists relinquish control of meaning in order for readers or viewers to produce subjective individual meanings for themselves. This opposition bypasses the possibility of a kind of plurality of meanings that Houston A. Baker Jr. argues is liberated by the critique of the given universal meaning that is an essential component of the black public sphere. Instead of meanings being in the artwork or in the individual, Baker argues that the critique of the fixed given universal meaning of white male culture casts light on a variety of invisible publics, that is to say, opens up the text or the work, not to the unmarked abstract individual, but to the social plurality of other voices, other desires, other knowledges and other interpretations of subaltern counterpublics. 
Consider the translation, transposition and reinterpretation of traditional gospels and hymns into sorrow songs that became a global currency of black spirituality. And consider Baker's interpretation of Martin, Martin Luther King's wish to be remembered as a drum major for justice. The drum major leads a marching band of followers, sometimes with highly unique style. One might say a unique black cultural style if one recalls the high-stepping, smoothly coordinated Florida State A and M marching bands of the 1960s. This Florida band, in the tradition of Marcus Garvey's remarkable drill teams with sparks flying from taps on their heels as they paraded summer streets of Harlem, combined the precision of military drill teams, the flair of black fraternity step shows and the choreography of black post-funeral gyrations in New Orleans. The result was, at least, a revolution in halftime entertainment. The band's drum major fronted and guided a dazzling display with baton-wielding, deep-bowing, downright magical grace. If the field of reference of King's drum major includes such grace and th synthesizing energy, then surely it is more than a common metaphor. It can be read as both a vibrant conceit and a type of mounting or performative trope for an aesthetics of montage. In the second part of this lecture, I want to move away from the binary of open and closed and build in its place a more complex model of meaning. I want to retain the multiple meanings and indeterminacy that is at the heart of post-structuralist semiotics, but without the subjectivism, relativism and idealism that so often characterizes theories of meaning in contemporary art.